how y'all doing? My name is Jay Black. I work for the Center of Collaborative Journalism at Mercer University. And the reason why I bring this up at this moment is because I go to a lot of cocktail parties. And when you first introduce yourself, you say, hey, my name is Jay Black. What's your name? And then they tell you. And then they say, well, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I, I teach journalism, which is strike one and strike two for a lot of people. Inevitably, the next thing they tell me is, or they ask me is, are you teaching students to do it right. And I said, do it right. Do journalism right. And they said, well, yeah, because it's broken. And you know what? I never quite understood why they had this idea that journalism was broken, except that it's all the time breaking news now. Breaking news. Everything is breaking news. The idea that people have is that somehow along the way, we've lost the idea of objectivity in news. My contention is that this is a fallacy because we never had it. We never had it because news is made by people, and it's reported by people, and they're all humans. And we all have to rely on people and what they gather as information for our information as a collective whole. Now, this relies on a lot of things because uh, you have to accept a, um, an idea that you have to trust them to get your information. There is no information in your brain that you didn't trust someone to give to. For instance, uh, Dakota, just turn around here just for a second, will you? This is for you, Katie. If you unscrewed Dakota's head, just like this, hold this for me, would you? Yeah. And, and scooped out the brain and put it right there on, on, on the table, that brain looks pretty much like every every other brain you, you could possibly see. Now, some brains are you know, better looking than others, but you know, for the most part, they look exactly the same. And it's this way since birth, since birth. Matter of fact, every time you use that brain, you gather more information. And this starts actually before birth. If you think about this for a second, people who are born in the eh, late, winter, early spring, they tend to be more compassionate people. Primarily because when they are in the womb, their mother is trying to stay warm and they're holding on tight. But people who are born in late summer and early fall, their mother has been gestating that baby all summer long in this position right here. Get the damn thing out of me. We are programmed from even before we are born to believe and to feel certain things. And it continues throughout the rest of our life. And so the, what we do is we come up with our own concept of truth. Truth is a very strange thing because truth can never fully be proven without trust beyond your five senses. We are operating in a reality right now all together in this room because our five senses accept the fact this, that this room exists. We can prove it. We look around, we see the curtains. By the way, very cool curtains. There's me up here, there's doors, there's people around you trying to figure out what's going on. But outside of this room, you can't prove anything exists. Oh, you can accept the fact that your dog is at home waiting for you. But you can't prove it. Oh, you can call your spouse and say, is, is my dog there? And they can say yes, but that person might be lying to you. We constantly, constantly have to rely on other people for our own truths. And so when we doubt the media, well, there is no way that it can appear objective. But the thing is, we never truly had objective news. It's all a fallacy. The idea that news must be objective, and we started teaching students to be objective, was after World War I. About the time some of, some of us were born, and after that, all of us here were born. Now, if you go back in time, though, and I was just talking to somebody earlier, well, the reason why we have a free press is because 
it's important that we get those informations out. Well, it wasn't always that way. During the colonial period in America, you had the freedom to agree with the king on every issue. If not, then you were tarred and feathered, and your print, printer was tossed into the river. And this is important because the people say, well, this is the reason why we wrote that Constitution thingy, that beautiful, wonderful First Amendment that we have, and that it guarantees us the right to speech, to the press, to religion, petition, and, of course, uh, that other one. Uh, 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 what is it? Assembly. Assembly, that's right. I can never get my thoughts assembled on that one. But the very first thing that happened after we developed this wonderful constitution is the partisan press. Now, during the revolution, you kind of had the opposite problem. You had, uh, you had to agree with the revolutionaries or the very same things would happen to you. You would be tarred and feathered and tossed out uh, of town and your printer tossed into the brink. Then, after the revolution, however, you don't want your revolutionaries around anymore. I mean, Sam Adams, one of the best revolutionaries we ever had, but after the revolution, we got rid of him. We don't know what happened to him. And that red coat that he wore everywhere, I mean everywhere, he was a very smelly man. So what happened after uh, Washington is that the different segments of the political structure started buying press time. And they would develop the stories in the press. And so you got the view of one side of politics. And then when Adams became president, he, per he, he uh, passed, Congress passed the first uh, Peacetime Sedition Act, which one of the elements was you could not talk poorly about the president or Congress. Oh, you can say all kinds of stuff about the vice president, who happened to be Thomas Jefferson. You can say anything you want about him, but not Congress and the president. Matter of fact, on an anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in Boston, they were having this big celebration of fireworks and cannons going off, and one a local lawyer <clears throat> turned to somebody next to him and he says, we ought to take those cannons and shove them right up John Adams' ass. Somebody heard him, and he wasn't thrown in jail for a couple of years. We didn't have objective news back then, nor did we ever intend for news to be objective. The partisan press continued until about the 1830s when Jackson came on. Now, in the early 1800s, we started developing, or Robert Hoe and company started developing the uh, uh, steam press. And what the steam press allowed us to do is rapidly create newspapers. Whereas before, the press would always um, uh, depend on one sheet at a time, the steam press could produce millions of them millions of newspapers, which brought the uh, cost of a newspaper down from the startling six cents a piece down to a penny. Now they were creating news for the masses. Everybody could read. Now, the nice thing about this is that it helped li the literacy rates, but it changed what we uh, conceived of, of uh, the uh, news. Matter of fact, because of uh, this equipment, it was the first time that journalism was known as a career full of hoes. <laughs> I didn't think that you'd get that one. So we have, uh, instead of having uh, partisan press of people buying space in a newspaper, what we had is that we had people getting very rich off of, off of the selling of massive amounts of newspapers. And so at this point, what we did was we sold newspapers to make money. If something didn't make money, well, it wouldn't appear in the newspaper. So we started seeing scandalous things like uh, police beats 
and prostitutes, talks about prostitutes and murders and, 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 and really fun news. But it was all geared to sell the maximum amount of newspapers that we could. Thus, the concept of gatekeeping started, that we had to make decisions on what would become uh, news. And it was also about this time when we started seeing professional reporters. And if you are a pro professional reporter, you have to decide on what you cover. All of that is not objective. Why do we cover certain things? Why do we cover the government? We don't cover the government in order to make a better society, though the high-minded among us believe that, or think they do. If it doesn't sell newspapers, it doesn't get in the paper. Even today, if it doesn't get sell time on television, it doesn't get in the newscast. It's about this time that in 1835, a story started developing in the New York Day, which was a, or New York Sun, called Great Astronomical Discoveries. Now, the person that, that wrote this was Richard Locke, and it was about a guy by the name of John Herschel, who, these are small uh, pictures, so let me kind of explain them. What the first story, uh, uh, and it was about a seven or eight piece uh, story, what, what they did was, in South Africa, they set up this giant telescope that, if you'll notice, it, it got the light from the moon, passed it through a microfine, uh, um, uh, a microfine, what do you call them? Uh, thank you, magnifying glass. And it beamed the light into this little shed where they were able to then look on a screen what was going on in the moon. And it was great. What they found first that they found were uh, mountains and volcanoes. And then when they you know, tilted it a little bit more, they found that, uh, that there, were, there were temples or buildings and then, 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 then plants and animals. And eventually they found probably the greatest scientific discovery of all time, bat people living on the moon. This is a true story. Now, those of you who don't know a lot about the history of journalism, we have, uh, at this time, hoaxes such as this, they were very common because they sold newspapers. It didn't matter if they were true or not. They sold newspapers because everybody wanted to know about the bat people. Even today we care about Batman. But back then, this was a new thing. Well, a couple people you might know wrote hoaxes for the newspapers. Uh, Mark Twain wrote hoaxes, just made up the stuff, printed it. Edgar Allan Poe, once this story came out, he, he wrote a lot of hoaxes as well. But when this came out, he said, I ain't writing this anymore, and he started writing short stories instead because this was the greatest hoax of all time. Now, Benjamin Day, who owned the Sun, never admitted that this was a hoax. To this day, his descendants say, oh no, it's true. There is no way that you can prove it's not true. We have to accept the fact from our preconceived notions and that we know that this is not true. And what we know now, you know, looking back, it's easy. But what we discovered, the great astro astronomical discoveries created a perception of reality that each of us took in. And the re way they did it, it was plausible science for the day. Now we know that the moon doesn't give off its own sun or light anymore. But back then, yeah, we didn't know that. Attribution. He interviewed people and said they said this. And they seemed like, you know, experts in their field. It didn't matter that he, you know, made up some of them. They sounded like experts. Expert testimony. You see, Herschel was a real astronomer, and people knew him. Matter of fact, his father was an, uh, an astronomer as well, and was knighted by the king. And so you don't get much more experts than that. And furthermore, the religious leaders at the time were also, were also, uh, um, uh, telling people that, well, it's only a matter of time before we, we uh, find space people. And we're going to have to figure out how to convert them to Christ. So, which leads us up to the letters of the day, which basically 
were in the other newspapers saying that this can't possibly tr be true. We need truth in news. We need moral force, public service, and fairness. This all came out of the moon hoax. Now, which brings us to today. Between the moon hoax and today, we started, uh, uh, we started uh, developing certain things such as the inverted pyramid in, in uh, Civil War, and we started uh, uh, understanding that we need information that we can rely on, and all of this just started to gestate while people were getting extremely rich on the media. Now, bringing it to today, we have, why is today's news broken? Well, there's a very, and a, various and sundry reasons why. First of all, we are creating, with the internationalization of news, most of the news organizations are centered in America. Thus, people in China know more about our government than a lot of the people who live in America, thanks to AP International and other American organizations. CNN, breaking news, CNN started with a $1 million budget in 1980 at a time when CBS News had a $60 million budget for just one hour a day. Once that happened, people started slicing and dicing newsrooms. Uh, the idea of it bleeds, it leads. It went down in flames because poll after poll, people said, we don't want bad news, we want happy news. And then, once they gave them happy news, they stopped listening to it. Radio. All of your radio stations, almost all of your radio stations are owned by major corporations. Out of San Antonio and other places like that. So, remember when you used to, uh, a storm was coming, you turned on the radio to find out what was going on? I didn't know that a tornado had hit Eisenhower a couple years ago until I read it in the newspaper the next day. We've lost that local bit. And, and newspapers, sorry, they're closed. And those that aren't closed have accepted the fact that in order to survive, they have to go hyper-local. Now, how they go hyper-local? By concentrating on what is around their people that buy newspapers. Problem with that is, instead of hiring more reporters, they're cutting their staffs. So the newspapers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So, which brings us to... <laughs> Social media. <laughs> Social media, or as I like to refer to it, is uh, WTF. What's happening with that? Social media creates an extremely hyper sense of, of news and reality that it's, that, that, that it's all about you. Uh, pushes a slanted agenda where even facts can no longer be agreed upon, gives us the ability to seek out information and news that reinforces our already perceived realities. And since facts can't or can now be slanted, anything can be proven by anecdotal evidence. So, what do we go from here? My school has opened up the, the um, Center for Collaborative Journalism, where we're trying to teach a new generation of journalists. But it's more than just a journalist, because we're all journalists now. We all are creating information. And so, what I have come to the conclusion is that this thing called objective news will never be a end all. It will never be a destination. We cannot have totally objective news. However, shouldn't we try? Shouldn't we try not only to train our future journalists, but since everybody is an information maker, we have to train them as well. And that's what we're trying to do at the Center for Collaborative Journalism. And that's what I got. Thank you so much.